praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly This morning is a a beautiful and wonderful time in the life of our church. Uh, We hopefully have the opportunity and the privilege to do this a couple of times a year where we actually invite families who have children that they want to bring in dedication to the Lord before this church family and before God. And so we have a couple of aspects of that that we're going to be talking about this morning. Uh, We not only believe that it's important for us to 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 talk about the dedication of of families and of children at this point in life, but we also believe that it's important to talk about the preservation of of children and of babies from the very beginning of their conception. 
And so I'm going to ask our Director of Children's Ministries, Melinda McMillan, to come and share a couple of things with you, and then we're in a moment we'll invite the families to join us up here. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Um, like Dr. Lawson already said, happy Mother's Day to those of you who are mothers here. Um, this is a very exciting day to celebrate just all the hard work that you pour into your children um, and raising them up in the ways of the Lord. So before we begin our child dedication, I did want to take a moment to tell you about um, our baby bottle campaign that we are starting up today. Um, if you have been with us here at First Baptist for a while, you're probably pretty familiar with the baby bottle campaign. It comes around once a year, um, typically runs Mother's Day through Father's Day. And what it is, is it is a fundraiser to support True Options Pregnancy Center here in Sherman, about a block or two away downtown. Um, and True Options is a nonprofit um, whose mission is to help women facing crisis pregnancies, um, equip them with hope and help, um, resources so that they can choose and cherish life. Um, so they do this through a variety of different ways. They provide free parenting classes to these young moms. Um, they provide adoption referrals for those that feel maybe they don't have the support to parent at this time. Um, they provided limited OB ultrasounds. Um, client advocates meet with them, nurses. So really the idea is they want to walk through a hard time in the life of um, a mother with an unplanned pregnancy. They want to walk through that time with her um, and be kind of that sounding board um, and really just kind of the hands and feet of Jesus. So um, I used to be involved with that ministry. Personally, what I love most about it is um, they share the gospel with those girls there. Um, and so not only do they try to help them understand the significance of, of life, um, you know, human life, but also the significance of being a born-again believer. Um, so they share that hope with the women as well. So this baby bottle campaign, we are going to have it set up, baby bottles in our Children's Welcome Center as well as our preschool preschool welcome center downstairs. You may have seen baby bottles when you came in. Feel free to grab one when you're leaving church today. You can fill it up with change, uh, maybe that you find in between your couch cushions or under, under your, you know, in your car, under the seat, um, you know, and you would be surprised how much it adds up. I know a few years ago they raised almost $40,000 uh, just through spare change with the generosity of churches in the area. So um, wanted to invite you to be a part of that, and again, that will run Mother's Day through Father's Day. All right, well, we will go ahead and segue into our child dedication. So I would like to ask the families who are dedicating children today to please come up to the stage, and we will get started with that. You know, this is, this is really a, a, such, a, such a special, special time because um, we think about the, the wonder of what it means to be parents. And I noticed that uh, a couple of y'all had to really uh, pry those young ones from the hands of their grandparents to get them up here. So, but y'all get them back in a little bit, okay? But we're thankful that y'all have come today to, to share your families with us and more importantly, to share them with the Lord. And I just want to say a couple of things related to that before I share something a little bit more formal with you. Um, in, in these days, with so many different philosophies and ideologies and mindsets and versions and expressions of what people say the truth is, it's very important to find something that is, that is substantial and something that is proven, something that is, is real to anchor your families to. And I want to say to all of you that, that that something is God and it's the Word of God and essentially as well it's also the church of God uh, because the church is, is one of those opportunities where the, the, the growth and the development and the maturity of your families in the Lord can take place in a real and, and helpful way. In just, a, in just a moment, some things are going to happen where we're going to give you the opportunity to introduce your families to us, and then we're going we're gonna to actually pray for your families. We're going to say some things to you about that. But today really is a special day for your family because it's a day of dedication, it's a day of dedication of your child and of yourselves to the Lord. And so what is it that's really happening here? And quite simply, this is a moment in time when a family openly acknowledges their need and their desire for God to be present in the comings and in the goings of your family's life. It's a moment for us, the congregation, to commit together to pray for these children as they grow and develop physically and mentally and emotionally 
They would also grow spiritually and to pray for you as you lead them into that kind of life. So today is a day of dedication. It's also a day of presentation, a day when you present your child and yourselves to God prayerfully, asking for his help and his wisdom in your lives as you navigate the challenges that life is going to bring to your doorstep. Today's also a day of celebration. It's a day to celebrate family, understanding that children are a gift from God. We come today to give thanks to him for this gift and more importantly, to dedicate these families for God's purpose. In scripture, we're told that children were once brought unto our Lord Jesus for him to put his hands upon them. He then put his hands upon them and blessed them. Today is a day of bringing your children to the Lord and asking his blessing upon them, not just for today, but for the entirety of their lives. So I want to encourage you to address heaven daily with prayers for your children, that God would save them in eternity, that God would lead you by his Holy Spirit, that you might lead them into his ways, and that they might become vessels of his glory. And as you pray for your children, may there be many days when you not only pray for them, but pray with them, teaching them to commune with God, to walk with God, to seek God in their own hearts. And may the God of all grace and strength strengthen you for and in this amazing task and holy privilege of parenting. In just a few moments, as we introduce your children, we're going to place in your hands a small Bible for your children. This Bible is not just a book. It is the Word of God. And I would pray that they would be far more familiar with that book than any other book they'll ever read. The undertaking of parenting is filled with great joy as well as great challenge. And so our prayer for you today is that God would walk beside you every step of this amazing journey as you commit your family to Him in this place today. So what I want you to do is I want you to each introduce yourselves and your children because some of these folks may not have met you all before. And uh, do the, we're gonna do this one at a time and once you have introduced yourselves and your family, then Melinda's gonna share some thoughts about your family and some scripture and then we'll pass on to the next one. So Yale, if you would begin for us, please, sir. My name is Yale Purple. This is my wife, Amanda. And this is our two month old son today, Bentley. Yeah. All right. Bentley is so adorable. So I just want to share with you guys um, a verse that we discovered um, for Bentley. Um, it goes with his name, and stand, so his name stands for From the Peaceful Meadow, and the Bible verse with his name is Psalm 23, 1 through 2, which says, The Lord is my shepherd. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures beside the still waters. All right. All right, sir. Uh, my name's Eric Lampy. This is my wife, Connie Lampy. Uh, this is our daughter, Bree Noel Lampy. She's a little over four and a half months old. Uh, we've got my mom and sister out in the audience. Uh, Y'all probably know Graham, Brenda Lampy, Dominic Lampy, uh, Grandpa up in, the, up in the booth up there. All right. <laughs> my sister, Lori, my brother, Jason's at the house. Awesome. Thank you. She is so cute. I love that little headband. <laughs> She's dressed so cute. So for Bree, um, her name means virtuous. And the Bible verse to go with her is Ruth 311. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you whatever you ask, for all my people in the city know that you are a woman of excellence. Hi, my name is Lloyd Blanton. This is Ashley Blanton. And we have Zoe, Amelia, Nora, Jackson, Logan, and Samuel. Awesome. I love this family. Y'all will amaze me with all of your six kids, and they're all so fun and all of their personalities. I'm excited that y'all are dedicating Logan and Samuel today. Um, Logan's name means devoted to God, and the scripture to go with his name is Philippians 4, 6. Do not worry about anything, but pray and ask God for everything you need, always giving thanks. And then for Samuel, his name means heard by God. And the scripture to go with it is Psalm 118, 21, which says, I will praise you for you have answered me and have been my salvation. All right. I want to say a few things to you now as we really come to the time of dedication. Thank you for introducing your families to us and thank you for sharing them with us here today. We are blessed by your blessings that God has gifted to you in the, in the 
persons of your children. And what a special thing it is for you to be in this place today. The time before us is really deeply symbolic, but I want you to understand that it is only symbolic. The events of this day are not sacramental in the sense of being able to bring salvation to your children. Prayerfully, that will come as you pursue God's plan for parenting. If there's no follow-through, then all of this will be to no avail. If the symbolism of this day translates into action that is taken throughout your lifetimes, you will have invested well in the process of parenting. So you're here so that several aspects of, of, the, of that process can be highlighted. First, I want you all to understand that your children really are a gift from God. They were His before they were yours. God Himself has created them and has given life to them. God Himself has given them to you. He's chosen these children to be in your families, and He's gifted that to you. So it's vital that we recognize our need to treat them as a wonderful gift from our gracious Heavenly Father. Scripture makes it clear that God knew them first and loves them best. So your children are indeed a special gift from God, and I charge you today to love them well and to lead them well. Understand that your children will grow to need Jesus in their lives. You won't believe me when I tell you this, because I know that all of your children are perfect in your eyes. But every one of these children has what we call a sin nature. And if you haven't discovered it yet, just give it a little time. One of these days, you'll ask them to do something, and they'll stomp their foot, and they'll say, no! And you'll say, whose child is this? What have I done? And one of these days, that sin nature is going to show up because every, every individual that's ever born on this planet has that, and every individual that's ever born on this planet needs forgiveness from God through Jesus Christ, His Son. And Scripture makes it clear that Jesus wants your children to come to Him. So understand the vital part that you will play in helping your children discover God's love and forgiveness and lead them well in that direction. Also understand that your children are a work in progress. They are filled with potential. Their story is yet unwritten. Their positions are unestablished. As their parents, you'll have the greatest influence in these formative years to shape them, to mold them, to help them develop in, in their perspectives of life and its meaning and purpose. Scripture makes it clear that you have a vital role to play in ensuring that your children learn God's truth. So I want to ask you this morning, in dedicating your children, your families to the Lord, your household to the Lord, will you commit to expose your children to the teachings of God's Word in your home and in His church? We will would be the right response. Great. The task before you is the most important undertaking in your lives. And I want to say to you that you're not alone in this. This church is more than willing to commit to you that they will stand with you as encouragers, as educators, as mentors, and examples if you will let them. They will be an invaluable resource for you if you so desire. So I want to say a word to you. I'm committing a lot on your behalf this morning. I'm committing you to do what I'm saying, to pray for these families, to encourage them as you have opportunity to do so, to let them know that you will love their children, to let them know that you will care for them, to let them know that you will help them every step of the way as you have opportunity to do so. So I'm going to ask you to do this. If you will commit to pray for these families as they raise their children and, and dedicate them here today to the Lord, if you'll commit to assist them in this great adventure of family life, if you would commit to do that, would you let them hear you commit to do so by just affirming that with a congregational amen. amen. I believe these people will do what they're saying. And I want you to know that we are unequivocally here today to be here for you if you need us, to be here with you as your families grow, uh, to, to just walk this journey with you and to experience and share the joys and the sorrows, the heartaches and the happiness that God brings every step of the way. And so what we want to do now is I just want to pray for your families and pray that God will honor you and bless you in every way imaginable. So would you bow with me as we pray? Father, we come now in the strong name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus. And we ask that you would just bestow your blessings, your generous blessings on these parents and on these children. Lord, as they, as they begin to grow and, 
and develop and mature. I pray that these parents will see the opportunities that you give them to, to speak words of, of truth into their lives, to, to help them understand the, the prioritization of the things of God, to see in their family life that God is more than just a word or a name, but it's actually someone who has given priority and commitment and surrender. I pray that they would seek you for wisdom and grace. Lord, I pray that these children will grow up to know the Lord Jesus, that they'll grow up to accept him and trust him as Savior and to follow him for all of their days on this planet. Father, what a, what a treasure it is to be entrusted with the, the lives of young, beautiful babies, children, to, to nurture, to care for, to hold. Thank you for gifting these parents with that, and I pray that they'll never, ever see their children as anything other than God's special treasure entrusted to them by your grace. Thank you so much for their willingness to say today, we dedicate our children and our home to the Lord. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
I'd like to ask you to take your Bibles and turn again to Philippians chapter 1. As we continue our examination of the model for a missional church, we're going to read verses 3 through 11 with no comprehension or conception of being able to cover all that's in those verses this morning, but they are a section that actually constitutes a prayer that Paul is praying for the Philippian believers. And as he prays for them, we learn some things from the way that he prays that will be helpful to us as we understand what God wants his church to look like. So beginning in verse 3 of Philippians chapter 1, the scripture reads this way. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in defense of the confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Father, we ask now that in these moments that are before us, you might speak powerfully to your church, to our hearts, helping us to understand what you desire in your church, what you've designed for your church, so that, that we will not build it according to our specs, but according to yours, that we'll follow the plan you have and the program you've established and be truly a missional church as we are commissioned and sent into the world to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. So we begin to talk again about the church. As we talk about the church, we want to, to talk about it not in terms of what culture or cultural Christianity or society or human opinion or wisdom has decided the church ought to look like. We want to talk about the church in terms of what God has designed the church to look like. We want to talk about the church in terms of what God desires that his church should be. We don't want to be the ones who usurp the place of God in figuring out and forming the church. We want to learn what God designs and to, to move ourselves under that, to let God decide the pattern, the program, the process for his church. Because only when that happens will we truly be a missional church. And by the way, I might say that with the seismic cultural shifts that are occurring at bullet speed in our world, it is absolutely vital that the world is able to look into the church and there to see something that is both stable and substantial in which it can discover God's truth. So, so we have to be firmly set, firmly established, immovable when it comes to understanding and settling on God's truth. That has to be the standard by which we function the standard by which we form ourselves. And, and so we, we must understand what God has. And so as we look at this model for a missional church in the letter from Paul to the congregation of believers at Philippi, we step into this prayer that Paul has prayed or is praying in his day for the church. Now remember, he wrote this down. This is a, a letter that he sent to them. And so he's had some time to give this some thought. This is not some spontaneous prayer that Paul just begins to pray and, and, and maybe in, in, a, in a desire or an effort to find some words to say just comes up with this. He's given it some thought. When, and when he begins to pray for the church, he's praying for a church that he sees as a, a wonderfully dedicated group of people 
that are sincere in their spiritual their spiritual walk, their spiritual development, they're, they're desiring to be in their community, in their world, everything that God wants his church to be. And so Paul is praying for them to be that. He's praying for them to be everything that God has desired and formed and fashioned the church and created it to be. That's what he wants. And so as he prays, this prayer becomes something of, of an extension of the model for a missional church. And it may look different in, in the early part because before the church can ever be faithful and successful or effective in our mission in the world, there's some things that have to happen in the church. And, and I'm, I'm thankful that God is doing some good things in this church. And we're going to see as we look at this this morning some more things, some other things that God wants to do in his church. And so I want to say to you that the, the gist of what we'll be saying this morning is summed up in this statement. The missional church pursues relational depth within and among itself. Relational depth. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that, that we seek to have deep and meaningful relationships with our brothers and our sisters in Christ. That, that we do not view ourselves as so individualistic so separated, so disconnected from each other that this is just a place that we gather and, and, and see each other and say hello and go on about our business. Relational depth needs to be understood. And there are three aspects of it that I want to share with you this morning that come right out of this prayer that Paul is praying for the church. And I would hope that we would strive, that we would, we would give ourselves in great effort to, to, to see these kinds of things developing in our church in our body, in our family of faith as we move forward to take up the mission that we've been called to accomplish. So Paul begins this way. He says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Relational depth begins with great appreciation for our fellow believers. To be a missional church, there has to be a sense of appreciation that we have for each other in our mission. As Paul begins to speak to this church, he uses these words about them. I thank my God. Now, whenever Paul begins to pray for those that he shares community with, that he shares mission with, that he shares faith with, his prayer is not aloof. It's not distant. It's not something that is impersonal. It's not something that is trite. It's not something that is d distant or distracted or insincere. Rather, for Paul, as he begins to think about these believers from Philippi, his, his expression is filled with gratitude. And he says, I thank my God upon every single remembrance of you. Now, we've got to understand something here. That whenever we begin to remember those that we do life with, that included in those memories are some things that are good, and then there are other things, right? Right? I mean, there's not any one of us that can do life with everyone else around us for an extended period of time and not do something that causes other people around us to, to step back and to say, I wish he hadn't done that. In fact, if, if most of us had $100 for every time that somebody else had said that about us, we'd be in pretty good shape because most of us have done plenty that people say about us, I wish he hadn't done that. So Paul says, however, every time I think about you, and he's going to mention some things later in this letter that are not flattering things. But he says, every remembrance that I have, every time that, that, that you come to my mind, I am giving gratitude to God on behalf of you. What is it that causes Paul to be able to do this? What is it that would cause us to be able to, to extend gratitude to God for every member upon every remembrance that we have? Now, the first thing I think that would contribute to that is the content of our hearts. Whenever Paul begins to pray, he's praying from a heart that is kindly toward those that he's speaking about. The thoughts of this church brought fullness of gratitude to Paul's heart. He was kind-hearted towards them. He thanked God every time that he remembered them. Now, as I, as I read this, I was thinking about remembrances of this church. And I ask myself this question, as I've prayed for this church, for the people of this church through the 21 plus years of ministry that I've been able to share with you here, 
Has my prayer constantly, every single time, been a prayer where I said, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you? And I had to take a step back and say, you know, maybe not. But then I began to think about people. Not, not just, not just the, the sea of faces, but people. And I, I began to think about David back here playing his, his horn and Ken back here playing his instrument and Joe over here playing his guitar and Tim over here playing the, the drums and whoever's playing this or that, or Shannon leading and the group singing. And, and as those faces begin to, to move across my mind, and then I begin to think about people and where you sit out here and, 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 and Clay got out of my line of fire this morning so I couldn't... Uh, yeah. I see you. And, 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 and as I did that, I just, I, I start, names started coming to my mind. And I started saying, I thank God for Rick and Kathy. I thank God for Buck and Marie and their family. I thank God for J.D. and Charlotte. Good to see y'all here this morning. And I was just beginning to thank God for the people in this church. And, and my heart was warmed. And I thought, wow, what a, what a blessing that is to me to just say thank you, God, for being able to, to share my faith life, my walk with God, with the beautiful, wonderful committed, surrendered, kind people in this congregation. And I'm going to tell you, it, it just changes everything about you when you begin to do that. Listen, if, if you've got some sort of a, of, a, of a disconnect or a distance or maybe you feel separated or maybe you're not totally plugged in and you think, man, you know, I just don't know that, that, that's, that, 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 that this is a place I belong, just start thanking God for the people around you. You watch what happens. You watch what happens. Move away from the critical spirit. Move away from the, the, the eye that's always looking for something to be a little bit upset about or discontent about and just start saying, thank you. Thank you for these people that I'm able to share my church life with, my Christian faith, my walk, my study of God's Word. Thank you, God, for every one of them. See, for Paul, when he began to think about these people, the first thoughts that come to his mind were not thoughts of criticism or harshness or discontentment. Paul was excited about them. So the content of his heart was important for the mission of that church. The content of my heart is important for us as we move forward in the mission of this church. The way that I think about those that I am on mission with is important, it's critical. So build relationships. The second factor in, in this is not just the content of the heart, but the conduct of the people. See, whenever Paul thought about them, he remembered some people, not just from the letter that he was writing to them, from this distance that he was now separated, but he, he went all the way back to Acts chapter 16 whenever he was in this place called Philippi. Now, if you're a, a Bible student, you will remember that Acts chapter 16 is a very interesting and even exciting story in the life of the early church because in that story, what happens is that Paul and Silas make their way to this place called Philippi, and they don't know anybody there. They don't know who's a believer who's, or who's not. They don't know if there are any believers there. And so they come on this lady whose name is Lydia. And, and, and they begin to speak to her about the things of God. And Lydia, of all things, whenever somebody shares the gospel with her, she receives Christ. Just so you know, it does work. Share the gospel. Somebody somewhere someday will receive Christ. It does work. And so she received Christ. Not only did she receive Christ, but Lydia clearly had the gift of hospitality because she told them, she says, I, I, I want you to come to stay at my place. And she made a place for them to stay. And if you remember the story as it unfolds, they began to share and to minister in that community. They began to talk to people about the things of God. And, and Paul, and poor Paul and poor Silas, they just couldn't seem to stay out of jail. You remember the story? They got thrown into the jail there. And, and, and they don't know how to act in jail because they're not criminals, so what do they do? They start praising God and singing hymns at midnight. And, and the prison doors fling open. And you remember the story of the Philippian jailer who comes and he's about to kill himself because he knows that he's going to be held accountable for all these prisoners. And Paul says to him, don't do yourself any harm. We're all here. And he asked that question, what must I do to be saved? And Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you and all of your house can be saved right here, right now. And these are the memories that come flooding into Paul's mind when he thinks about Philippi and thinks about his, his, his beginning there and, and, and the story of the formation of that church. And he thinks about these good people. 
And so these people were the kinds of people that, that he was remembering. They were authentic, committed people. And as he begins to speak to them further in this letter, he will commend them over and over and over again for things like their generosity, their kindness, their gentleness, their hospitality, all these wonderful things. So in Paul's life, you can see that there is clearly an internal connection that is both intimate and deep with this congregation. And that's the mark of their missionality. They're a missional church because they're together in this thing. They realize that they are called to, to connect their lives with each other in a common purpose and a common mission and ministry of moving the gospel forward in the world. So there's this great appreciation for fellow believers. Secondly, there's not only great appreciation, but there's also great consideration for these fellow believers. Paul says, as he prays for them, as he thanks God upon every remembrance, then he says, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you with all joy. Making request for you with all joy. Now, the, one of the key words in verse number four is the first word, the word always. Paul says, I don't just pray for you and forget it. He says, there's a constancy in my prayer for you. I pray for you constantly. And the word that he uses here is the Greek word dasis, which is the word that, that speaks about a petitionary prayer or making requests, just like it's translated here. So what Paul is saying is this. He's saying, when I pray and I pray for you, I'm asking God to do something special on your behalf I am thinking about you and what God can do in your life, through your life, how God can pour his favor and his blessing out upon you. Paul says, I am making petition for you before the very throne of God. I'm asking God to do incredible things in your life. I'm asking God to do incredible things in your family of faith. I'm asking God to do incredible things as he pours his gospel out through you to the lost world of the Philippians around you. I'm asking God to use you. And so he's, he's asking God on their behalf to do special things, wonderful things, to, to elevate them as a church in their community. And not only is he demonstrating and, ex, and exercising constancy in prayer toward them, but he also says, I'm doing this with all joy. In other words, when God's blessing is evident upon the lives of his fellow believers, he celebrates God's blessing with them. So there's a constancy in prayer that whenever God answers those prayers, there's a celebration of what God has done on their behalf. That word joy is actually a hallmark of this epistle, this letter that Paul writes. In fact, it's been called an epistle, the epistle of joy by many, many commentators. So what Paul is saying about them is whenever I think about you and I see your, your service, I see your, your, your demeanor, I see the way that you are, it brings joy to my heart, and I'm glad that God is blessing you, and I'm glad that God is blessing through you. For Paul, it was exciting to see God's work in and through the lives of his fellow believers. And he said, I'm going to celebrate that. And whenever God begins to bless the efforts of those that we do church with, whenever Someone tells us, you know, I, I was praying the other day and, and God just answered that prayer and I could see that it was a clear and overt answer to prayer, whatever it might have been. We, we just want to say, praise God, I'm grateful for what God has done in your life. Or if someone says, you know, I was, I was sharing my faith the other day and I was telling somebody about Jesus and this person opened their heart to Christ and received Jesus in their heart, we celebrate that with them. Whenever God's blessing and God's favor begins to be evident in the lives of those that we, that we serve God alongside, we celebrate that. That's, that's what church life ought to look like. We celebrate together with joy the victories and the, the blessings and the favor of God as he pours it out in our midst. And that's what Paul is saying. I am praying for God to bless you, and when he does, we're going to rejoice together that he's done so. That's, that's, that's the way the church ought to be. So you have this great consideration for fellow believers. You have this great appreciation for fellow believers. But not only that, you also see in Paul's prayer that, they have, that there's a great cooperation with fellow believers. See, this is where it moves beyond sort of the, the conceptual or the, the verbal into the act, into the work. Paul speaks about their kingdom awareness. Look at what he says in verse number 5. For your fellowship in the gospel. That word fellowship is, is a strong word. It's, it's a, a wonderful word in the New Testament. It's, it's that Greek word that would be pronounced koinonia. 
And in fact, what happens is that the New Testament is written in a style of Greek that's called Koine Greek. And that basically means, <clears throat> means common. It doesn't mean common in the sense of, of mundane or trite or, 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 or poor or anything like that. What it means is that it, it's what everybody holds in common. And so when he speaks about their fellowship, their koinonia in the gospel, he's talking about the fact that they have found a, a connecting point in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the mission to, to take that gospel to the, the known world, the world around them as they see fit. And so you have this, this wonderful, amazing cooperation, this kingdom awareness. He says their, their fellowship is in the gospel. Now what this means is, is simply this. Apparently they had grasped the content and the intent of the gospel. Now, I'm going to say that Christianity 101, the very basic of Christianity is this, that every believer who is a believer needs to be able to articulate the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought to be able to verbalize a witness to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and if you can't do that, there's help for that. We can instruct, we can teach, we can show, we can help. The gospel, according to Romans chapter 1, if you remember, I told you this, October the 10th, 1999. You remember that? <laughs> Some of y'all were here. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel is the power of God. Every believer ought to be able to articulate the gospel as it is in Scripture. So if you can't, that's the starting point. These folks had grasped the content and the intent of the gospel. They were alive in Jesus Christ because they had experienced in their hearts the transformational power of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ under the dynamic presence of the Holy Spirit as he revealed to their hearts the truth of who Jesus was and the work that Jesus had accomplished on the cross. And they had trusted him and they believed him and they were excited about Jesus. They were on fire for God. They were serious about their commitment, but they were also dynamic and they were alive. You didn't have to line them up with something to see if they were moving. They, they, were, they were on fire for God. You, you, you couldn't have taken a fire hose from next door and put that church out. They were burning white hot for Jesus. They were ready. They were a fellowship, a cooperation, a community. They had a mutuality. They had a, a mutual involvement. Their mutuality was located, centered, focused in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So they had a kingdom awareness that, that gave way to a consistent investment. He says, from your, for your fellowship in the gospel, then look at what he says, from the first day until now. He doesn't indicate any skips in that, does he? He says the gospel of Jesus was something that you, that you bought into, that transformed your life. And from the first day that you began to live in the fullness of the experience of the transforming power of the gospel upon your lives, you have not let up. You've not stepped back from that commitment. You've not been found on the sidelines. No one has had to send out a search party to see where you are in the cause of Christ or the kingdom of God. You've been right there on the firing line every single moment since that day. From the first day until now, there's no backsliding. There's no retreat. It, it's full speed ahead for them. Constancy in their investment in the gospel of Jesus. There never had been a need in their lives for a jump start. They stayed in a constant state of revival. Paul remembers them, and he remembers them well. And he thanks God that from the first day that he arrived... And he met Lydia. From the time that he spent there in the jail, and the Philippian jailer became a believer in Christ. And he saw that from those days, from that day, from the first day until right now, that they've been constant, they've been true, they've been faithful, they've been committed. And their commitment is not just around a gathering, but it's around the gospel. It's around the truth of who Jesus is. And what he can do whenever his power comes to bear on a life that is lost in sin. It has no purpose, no meaning, no hope in eternity apart from Jesus. So Paul prays for them. 
And in, in these first three verses of that prayer, we see that he has a heart for these people that, that gives way to expressing openly the love and commitment that he feels like he shares with them. And, and he's describing the, the, the depth of connection of a missional church. But I want to tell you something about this. I, I told you whenever we started that the missional church pursues relational depth. Now I want to close with this in a moment. Pursuing relational depth requires effort. It's not something that just happens because you happen to be in the same building, the same room. It requires effort. So I'm going to give you three things that I think would help that kind of thing become reality in your life and in the life as a whole of this church. And the first one has to do with you and me individually. This is what I would suggest. Become the fellow believer that others will appreciate. Work on, work on yourself. So what do I need to do to become the kind of believer, the kind of follower of Christ that people around me would say, man, I appreciate so much their heart for God. What would it take? Look at your life. Let, let, let God, through the power of His Holy Spirit and interaction with His Word, help you examine your life. And, and just adjust until you become the kind of believer. Now, some of you, that may not be hard because... Some of you, I, again, I can just say about you that you're just wonderful in your commitment to the things of God. Others might need to ramp it up a little bit to say, you know, I want to be that person and I want to give myself to that cause. Secondly, pray for the blessing of God to settle on other believers. You, you pray for those around you that God would use them in a mighty way to, to further His kingdom, to forward His gospel, to make His name famous, to give magnification to the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ to, 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 to pour the gospel out of their very soul, their very being, to, to become excited and alive in Christ to the point where there's just a, this, this fire of God that burns in their hearts. Pray for the blessing of God to settle in other believers and then celebrate when that happens. Third, recognize the power of deep relationships in advancing the kingdom of God. I've noticed this about people. They want to be included. People want to be included. They want to be in a group. They want to be, they want to be in a, a club. And, and some people will, they, they, they will pay a lot of money or endure a lot of, um, I guess, ritual or ceremonial requirements to be a part of a civic club, a social club. They'll, they'll, people will put on airs to be included in certain groups. People want to be included. But, but I want to say to you this morning, that, that, that the most important group that you will ever identify with and connect with and, and invest in is the body of Christ. It just is. There you will find people who are hopefully centered on the same gospel you are, who are willing to pray for God's blessing and favor to rest upon your life, who are trying to be the kind of believer that you would appreciate and love, and, and who will reach towards you with encouragement and grace and love to see you succeed and to be a part of this amazing endeavor of being a missional church. This is what God's called us to. For this, we've been called into creation. For this, we've been called into existence. For this, the church exists. We, we don't exist just to gather in a, in a central location on a Sunday morning. We don't exist just to gather in smaller groups and study the Bible. Those things are all beneficial and great and wonderful, but we exist to be on mission with God to, to, to proclaim the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to all the earth until He comes again. And in His Word, He says, this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the earth, and then the end will come. 
So we have, a, we have a goal, we have a role, we have a mission, we have a ministry, and that's what it looks like. I want us to be a missional church in every sense of the word, and I know you do too. I think the, 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 one of the basic building blocks of that is for us to have and develop and extend effort to have deep and meaningful relationships with each other. Now, for some of you, that might mean that you need to take a step back from some attitude that you've had about some other believer in this congregation or beyond it. It might mean that you need to ask God to forgive you for a critical eye. It might mean, it might mean that you need to ask someone to forgive you, to make your relationship right with somebody that you've been at odds with. Deep relationships take effort. Are you willing to extend that effort this morning? Well, let me tell you something. The most important relationship, the one that matters more than any other, and the one that needs to be the deepest relationship in your life is your relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you're here today and that relationship is not strong and deep and vital and vibrant, then maybe you need to do some business with Him today. Maybe today you need to bring your life in all of its parts and all of its pieces back to Him and to say, Lord, I want you to be at the center of who I am. I surrender my life in a fresh way to you. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never committed your life to Christ. You've never been saved. You've never had your sin forgiven because you've never bowed your heart, your life before the Lord and said, I need Jesus to be the forgiver of my sins. And I want to trust you, Lord, as my Savior. And today you need to take care of that. You need that to happen in your life. Today I'm inviting you to Christ. I'm asking you to trust Him, to believe Him in His Word, and to give your heart and your life to Him, to allow Him to forgive you for your sins and to bring to your life a right relationship with God and a connection with all of this family of faith. Maybe today you just need to be saved. I'm going to ask you all to bow your heads, please. In just a moment we're going to have some music playing and I'm going to pray, and I'm going to ask you to stand in a moment. And when I do, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you just to, to prayerfully consider what God might be asking of you or what God might be saying to you here today. And if there's anything in your life that needs to be adjusted, any commitment or decision that needs to be made, would you, would you simply say yes to, to Jesus right now? Just say, yes, Lord. Whatever you want, I'm willing. Whatever you want. Lord, and if, and if that means that you need to be saved, just say, Lord, please save me. If it means you need to be right with him, Lord, please help me to be right with you. Show me what that looks like. If it means that you need to be right with somebody else, ask God to help you heal that relationship. Father, in Jesus' name, we simply ask you today to speak. Speak to us, Lord. We wait, we listen before you. Give us courage to respond to whatever you might be prompting us to do in our hearts. If that means that we need to step out in these moments or maybe have a conversation later, whatever needs to happen, Lord, help us to just be obedient to you. In Jesus' name, would you stand with your heads bowed? And if there's a, if there's a decision that you need to make, that, that need, you need to come speak to myself or, or Adam, we're down front. We'd be happy to visit with you, anything that God wants you to do today. If you need to come trust in Christ, if you want to join this church, anything that God's laying on your heart, We'd be happy to visit with you about it. Just listen to his voice.